Hello, everybody. My guest today on Todd's podcast is Major League Baseball player uh, who broke into the bigs with the Baltimore Orioles in 2016. He was the American League uh, Major League Baseball Comeback Player of the Year in 2021. Mr. Trey Mancini, welcome to Todd's podcast, Trey. Hey, Todd. Thanks for having me on. Yep. Glad you're here. Uh, I know you're busy, and I appreciate you squeezing this in, so we'll jump right into it. Um, you're a product of Polk County Public School System. You played high school ball at Winter Haven High School. You went on to play ball at uh, Notre Dame, and you, from there you were drafted by the Oriole organization in the eighth round in about 2013. You played first base, outfield, and designated hitter. Um, what's your favorite position of all of those? Out of those, I would say first base. It's my natural position. Yep, I, um, that. I started I started playing T-ball when I was five years old um, at Sertoma Park, actually, in, in yep. Winter Haven. And um, I was always, like, the biggest kid on the team uh, all growing up. Like, and whenever you're the biggest kid, you normally get stuck at first base. So um, that's, that's the position I played growing up. And um, still to this day is my favorite position and where I feel the most comfortable, I would say. But I do enjoy the other two as well. Um, it was interesting learning outfield kind of on the fly whenever I broke into the majors. And um, DH is, is great because, you know, you have one job and it's to hit. Um, so it's a little bit of a different routine, but it's something I really enjoy doing too. So I'm not too picky. But if I had to pick, I'd say first base. The biggest thing is being on the field being able to hit. Where they put you is – secondary in my opinion and uh so i that that's interesting um tell us a little bit about your family you're from winter haven uh if you want to tell us a little about your family brothers sisters what your parents do any of that stuff yeah so i have uh two sisters uh we're all about three years apart i'm in the middle so um my older sister i have an older sister katie and a younger sister meredith um and um you know, we're still really close to this day. Um, I actually just saw them this past weekend. I did a, my family did a charity golf tournament in Winter Haven. So I got to see everybody there. Yep, um, and my parents, Beth and Tony still live in Winter Haven. Uh, my dad's an OBGYN there. He's delivered about a quarter of the town. I feel like, <laughs> um, at this point he's been practicing a long time. Um, and then my mom is a former nurse. Um, and, and, um, that's how they met originally. So, Good. um, yeah, yeah, great family, and we're all, you know, really close. Is he a Bond Clinic? No, he's at Gessler. Gessler, Gessler, okay, all right. Gessler, yeah. Okay. Uh, did you play any other sports other than baseball, either growing up or in high school, or were you always just focused on baseball? Baseball was always my best sport, but I played a lot of tennis growing up. Uh, I actually started playing tennis before baseball. Um, when I was three years old, I started, so um, – so yeah, it's definitely one of my favorite sports. And then I also played basketball growing up. Um, and re yeah, I really like basketball. A lot I think too. I think tennis is a great complement to baseball and baseball to tennis, just because of the eye hand coordination. And you've got to watch the bat hit the ball. You've got to watch the ball hit the racket, and you know it's wrist and arms, and it's just transference of weight. The and footwork. The, yeah, the footwork too in tennis really translates. Yeah to baseball a lot um and i think that has helped me especially on the defensive side and that's always my biggest piece of advice to kids is to play as many sports as you can when you're younger um there's a lot of things you learn in different sports and skills that translate and i think it just makes you an overall better athlete if, if you acquaint yourself with different sports right um so did you play travel you played travel ball when you were younger did you was that a good thing for you i, I my son never played travel ball um, played a couple years at Lake region. Um, but you know, he kind of shifted to golf, but I know the travel ball schedule is pretty hectic for, and pretty intense for young kids and the whole family's it involved. Is. It's not just you go and come home from Sertoma. You go and it's a weekend. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a lot, you, you know, um, it's a sacrifice from the whole family. You know, there's yeah. a lot of vacations you could go on, things you could be doing. Um, and instead, you're traveling around the state or country, um, staying in motels and playing travel baseball. And um, but I do think it it made me, and I think a lot of my teammates at every level would say that it made them much better baseball players. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it, it, it definitely, um, yeah, like it, and it, it teaches you playing in high intensity environments at a young age too, because those travel ball tournaments get pretty intense. Let me tell you. My, my nephew LB played and uh, one of your best friends and I'll talk about him. Oh yeah. I'll talk about him in a minute. But I was always worried and talking to my younger brother, Brad, who was LB's dad, said, you know, do you worry about him getting burned out at such a young age playing with such intensity? And he said, no, that's just how it is if you want to move on and get better. And, it, you know, it kind of takes some of the rec ball superstars out of the rec ball inventory. And, you know, then the rec ball is more of a casual thing and uh, certainly has its place for everyone as well. So I congratulate you on that. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, high school, you hit 480 as a senior. So, obviously, you're an average guy and you're a power guy. Then you go off to Notre Dame. What were you in, in Notre Dame? Were you a power guy? Were you a average guy, get on base, or a little bit of all of it? Um, Out of the two, I'd say a little more average. I hit for a good average every year. Um, And, and um, I, I guess I hit for pretty decent power too in college um but i would say at the time i was more concerned with um average you know the game's changed a lot now average isn't necessarily is that important it's still important but if you walk a lot and get on base on base percentage is, is much more important than average these days yeah. um that and like slugging and, and ops which is your slugging and on base percentage added together um but yeah, I would say, like, growing up, I was always a little more concerned with my average. Um, yeah. But that kind of changed as I grew up and my careers progressed a little yeah, bit. your body changes, you get stronger, you learn more, and you learn to turn. And I'm telling you, it's a Definitely. lot more fun jogging around the bases than running 90 feet to 90 feet to 90 feet to 90 feet. It, it is, especially <laughs> the older you get, the slower the slower you get. It's easier to jog around the bases for sure. Um, you know, it's... It's, it's much more fun. So when you were in high school, and I'll, I'll move on for that in a minute, but you were you were a stud in, in high school, and I followed your followed you a little bit, you know, kind of through LB and everything. You had a bunch of guys that were pretty accomplished on your teams. Have you ever thought about how many guys that you played with that were either just a little before you or a little after that got drafted and then were able to play in the in the in the major league baseball, not necessarily in the majors, but somewhere in professional baseball. I mean, I thought it was a pretty good accomplishment. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was a really, really special group we had there yeah. at Winter Haven. Um, and Winter Haven had such a great run for, I mean, a 10 year span, you could yep. say starting in 2004. Um, and, and to be a part and, you know, be teammates with all those guys is, still to this day in honor and it, we always joke you know we always say we're like the best team to ever not win a state championship uh <laughs> something always went wrong in the playoff uh, you know, i remember i remember that team, yeah yeah we had some heartbreaking losses especially in 09 uh, to this day we just uh it kills us um but yeah there were so many guys like the class of 08 marcus brisker um i got to play with he was drafted in the sixth round um Oh nine, Jeff Glenn got drafted out of high school. He was the catcher, the right? He was the catcher. I thought he Jeff, was. Jeff an, Glenn played. I thought he was an amazing catcher in high school. He's an incredible catcher. Um, such a good player and, and such a good talent. And then uh, from that class, LB and Joe Rogers yep. uh, also ended up playing pro ball after college for a while. Um, and a few other guys in that class, Austin Johnson and. Uh, ben Brown played at major D1 schools. And then um, in my class, myself and Colin Richardson, uh, you know, both played pro ball too. So, so in Colin, that was, Colin time, was in your class. I didn't remember he was in your class. Colin was in my class, yeah. So, you know, for six guys to play pro ball, at the minimum, I might even be forgetting somebody. Right. It was uh, pretty special. You know, we had a such a good group. We were so close. And we were just up at the field every day. Um, yeah. You know, we loved it. We just loved competing against each other, whether it was like pickup football, tennis, um, baseball, we were just always, you know, competing with each other. And it, it's there. And, and your coach was David Saliba and George Myers, weren't they the coaches? And was Rick Barely? They were, yeah. Coach was Rick Barely or was, yep. did Barely coach JV? Oh, of course. 
no, barely, no, barely was, uh, barely was there. So George Myers was the JV coach. Okay. Um, and then our varsity coaches were Coach Saliba, Rick Barely, Colin Martin, um, was the head coach at Weber. Right. Um, and yeah, so they were like our main three coaches. So, um, just such a, such a fun time. Coach Saliba, I can't say enough about too. Yeah. Um, what an incredible coach and somebody else that I think really helped prepare us all for yeah. baseball beyond high school. I, I agree. I, David graduated a year ahead of me in high school and George and Rick both graduated with me and I played tennis in high school. I wasn't good enough to play baseball and tennis because they're at the same time. So I picked tennis, uh, but a lot of my buddies played high school, and Rick and George were certainly one of them or two of them. Um, you know, full disclosure, you had mentioned LB a time or two. LB is my nephew, LB Dantzler. He's my younger brother's oldest son. And I said, LB, tell me a little something about Trey. He said, well, um, he's got a tennis story that I'll get to if we have enough time at the end. But he said, basically, I was Trey's Uber driver before Uber was cool because Trey wasn't old enough to drive. <laughs> so I was the one who always picked Trey up, and he talked about how y'all had become best friends and best buds and and did play tennis a lot and just hung out and did everything together. So uh, I, I'll, I'll get LB in a minute. But um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah LB I mean, to this day is my best friend. Uh, so, yeah, we, we've had some good times. Yeah, we'll talk about some stories off air because I certainly don't want anyone's mothers to be hearing stuff that they don't need to hear about. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about your experience in the majors. Who was the toughest pitcher that you ever had to hit off of? That's a great question. Um, and it's an answer that kind of changes every year. Yeah. Um, I've, I've faced some amazing, legendary pitchers, but um, somebody that I – like. <laughs> Just the way he pitches and his stuff, um, as far as pure stuff goes, I faced Dustin May on the Dodgers last year and was extremely impressed. Um, and um, as of now, I'd say he's the guy that I had the toughest time kind of seeing the ball against. And like his pure pitches, the way they move, um, it, it was it was really difficult and, and pretty incredible to try to hit again so he's my answer for toughest guy i've faced. good and 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 doing a little research i think uh you would uh back in high school had taken some hitting lessons from the doyle brothers blake and denny oh and yeah Ryan and those guys and i had taken my son over and, and we had done a few lessons i think we might have had uh denny might have been helping my son jacob i can't remember it's been you know, 20 years ago, and I asked him the same question, and he never even thought about it. He said, Nolan Ryan. He said, Nolan Ryan was the hardest throwing, toughest SOB to hit off of that he he was nervous about him. And they, you know, then I guess Roger Clemens came along, and he was the next tough one. So, uh, yeah, yeah those, are, those are two pretty good pitchers right there. Um, So, you, you bat right, you throw right. Uh, I've been in the American League your career and most of your career. Have you ever hit a home run over the green monster? Yes, I have. Um, I, one of my first homers, actually my first away home run, I believe was over the green monster. Um, so yeah, it's a really good feeling. Fenway is my favorite park to play at. Um, it's just incredible. The nostalgia there. Yep. It's so unique. So many, incredibly legendary events have happened there and it's, it's been there for over a hundred years. Um, so, and it feels like it too, you know, they've done a good yep. job renovating it, updating it, but it definitely feels like an old timey park. So it's a really special place to play. Um, and yeah, hitting up a hall over the green monster is, you know, was always a kind of pipe dream, um, that I had and a lot of other, oh, every kid, winter young, Haven, young kids every kid, winter Haven, has. yes. Did, yeah. So did you, it, when you hit it, did it you know it was special. when you hit it? Did you know it was going? Did you like kind of stare it a little longer? So. Or did you say, "Gosh, this may not make it. I better get going at least to second base." Yeah, it was a little. It was kind of a line drive, so it kind of like just snuck over it. But um, but yeah, I, I got it just enough for it to, to clear the monster. So it was a, a really cool feeling. Todd's podcast is sponsored in part by SVN Saunders Ralston Dantzler Real Estate. 
Since 1996, the firm has offered unrivaled brokerage services throughout Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. With over 90 expert advisors throughout the region, our team has the knowledge and resources to help clients realize their most ambitious real estate investment goals. When you choose SVN Saunders Ralston Dancer Real Estate, you have access to a diverse suite of commercial and land services, including forestry consulting, land management, auctions, property management, commercial leasing, and negotiating conservation easements. If you're seeking to invest in land or explore commercial real estate opportunities in the Southeast, contact us today at svnsaunders.com or call 877-518-5263. Five two six three to connect with an advisor today. Once again, that's S B N S A U N D E R S dot com, or by phone at eight seven seven five one eight five two six three. You played baseball most of your life. You know we've talked about that. What were your emotions the first time you stepped up to the plate? as a pro i mean in the majors um oh my gosh it was there i was nervous all day i remember um they had told me the night before i was going to be DHing the next night so that night came and i was just so nervous um and you have a little more time to think when you DH. so the game had started and i was just kind of like trying to stay loose and keep myself busy but i i almost felt like i was going to pass out um so but, but it's funny, once I went onto the field and got up to the plate, it all went away, and I just felt the most incredible, like, hyper-focus that I ever have in my life. Um, you know, the adrenaline was was incredible, but I was able to channel it. I was going to say, you have um, to control so that somehow. At, yeah, yeah, and it's tough to do, but I, I flew out my first at bat, and, um, you know, basically my goal was to not – look like an idiot my first at bat in the major so I accomplished that kind of took a deep breath and my next at bat um I hit I hit a home run and it was wow. just the most incredible amazing feeling in the world um and it's something I'll never forget and on a personal level I don't know if there's anything um that'll really top that feeling baseball wise so your first hit was a home run. That That is wonderful. Was your family able to be there? Were you able to give them enough notice to say, hey, I'm playing tonight, or were they in town? Or Yeah, so my mom was able to get up. My dad wasn't able to get up until my second game, um, but my mom was there. A couple aunts and uncles that lived in the D.C. area, um, they were able to obviously be there because it was close to D.C. And then one of my best friends from college, Brett was there. He was the one. There was a video that kind of went viral at the time of my mom going nuts. And my friend, my friend Brett was next to my mom in the video. A lot of people like were like, "Who is this guy?" Um, they thought he was like my young father, but he same age as me. Like he's like one of my best friends. So it was pretty funny uh, that people almost like confused him for my dad or like a brother or something like that. So it was pretty funny at the time. I would assume that everybody that was in your club right there was going nuts and you, I, could you hear them going nuts in the stand or were you just so focused on getting around the bases? Yeah, I was just focused on getting around the bases and, and there's so many fans of the game that you can't really yeah. um, pick out necessarily your family's cheers. But yeah, I was just, you know, I felt like I was walking on air, That's um, awesome. you know, when I was going around the bases, it was, it was definitely the fastest I've trotted around the bases for sure. Good. Um, in baseball, you know, probably more than any other sport, it's so driven by statistics and data and all that. There's statistics for everything. I'm, you know, I'm surprised there's not a statistic that someone's come up with on, you know, who's eating the most hot dogs at a, you know, at a double header almost. Yeah. What's the most yeah, obscure sure. stat that a hardcore fan has ever come up to you and asked you about? Anything oh my weird? gosh, that's a good question. Nothing too crazy off the top of my head, but there are just some like crazy stats out there now. Some of the things they can measure um, right. are incredible. I, I think it's neat how uh, there there is a stat called OPS Plus. Um, so that basically it takes your OPS, which is your on base percentage and slugging percentage, mixed together. 
and then it takes your your home park that you play at and some of the away parks um it factors all of that in and basically evens it all out and tells you how good of a hitter you are you know so like if you play in colorado you kind of get subtracted some points because it's a good hitter's park so they have a way to neutralize that now um across the board so like almost like handicapping uh, in golf uh, yeah, basically it's like handicapping in golf. And I think a lot of teams use that now in free agency and things like that. You know, they dig deep into those stats rather than things on the surface um, when they're thinking about giving guys deals and things like that. So just where the game's gone, some of the things they can measure are pretty wild to think about where, when you think about where the game was, you know, 20 years ago. Um, so it's, it's kind of obscure, but pretty cool, too. So the movie Moneyball, I'm, I would assume you saw that with Brad Pitt and Jonah. Was it yeah, Jonah oh, yeah, Hill. of course. And, and, you know, it kind of goes into stats versus the feel for the manager. How much of it is – how much do managers rely solely on stats and how much of it is, hey, I just got a feeling Trey's on today or he's having a good day, I'm going to put him in or, you know, or he struggles against this pitcher, I'm going to keep him out. I mean – is it really statistic driven that much in the management of the game and the management of the play? Or is that kind of the back office side where that's the business side of it when they're trying to bring players in, but it's still that manager making the decisions? That's a great question. Um, and that's the great debate right now in baseball is how much, um, you know, should the analytics and, and, these statistics be dictating who's in the lineup. Um, you know, it, it's kind of like the paper versus steel argument. Right. Um, I, I personally, I think in an ideal world, you have obviously you, you want a great analytics department. They're important um, doing all the research. Um, but at the same time, you want to have a manager that has a feel for the game um, and kind of, you know, knows when to write the hot hand and knows when to play the matchup. Um, so ideally, you know, the manager has that power, I think, but, um, you know, some clubs, it's just like all, almost computer generated the lineups. And then some, the manager has, um, a lot of say, you know, and they can override whatever, um, the book says for the lineup to be. So that is a great question. And a lot of teams do it differently. So there's no, I guess, answer to the question, but, um, yeah, ideally, I think you kind of have both. Well, you've given us perspective that I didn't know. I mean, everyone has an opinion, but it's nice to hear someone who plays the game and who's had to to, to deal with, you know, statistics versus managerial feel and the presence of the team and knowing, like you said, who's got the hot hand that day or that week or whatever. So, Yeah, um, that's still definitely important. Um, I, I – I, I want to move on uh, to ask you about uh, the date, March 27th, 2020. You left spring training to undergo a medical procedure. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I got to spring training that year and did our typical blood work. You know, we have basically entry, you know, blood work, all the baseline tests, just for a normal physical um, that they do every year. And my iron levels came back super low. Um, and they retested them again, and they were still the same. So they thought it could have been a weird test or something. But no, my iron levels were low. So at my age, originally, we were like, it's most likely a stomach ulcer or celiac disease. But luckily, the trainers um, did have some concern. And they you know, said, just in case, they're going to give you an endoscopy and colonoscopy. Um, and unfortunately, during the colonoscopy, they found a tumor in my colon. So um, a few days later, I had to fly up to Baltimore and, and get surgery. Um, so I, I actually found out on March 6th, and then March 12th was my surgery. And then another six days later, I found out that it was stage three colon cancer, and I had to do six months of chemotherapy. So um, it lined up right when COVID hit as well. So it was just a really bizarre time for everybody. Uh, but especially me going through this. And, um, yeah, I did six months of chemo um, and ended in September of 2020. And knock on wood, have been good since then. But, um, 
you know, it was an extremely scary diagnosis and um, life-changing diagnosis. And I missed that 60-game season that year. Um, and, and yeah, it was, it was crazy. You know, it was a rough, but, rough six months, but got through it and, and um, you know, lucky enough to be alive, A, and, yeah. and back playing, too. Um, so it was, it, you know, I never thought something like that could happen to me, but, um, you know, it was uh, definitely a perspective changer and, and something that I try to use for the better now. Well, you definitely had a bunch of family and friends and uh, teammates and everyone back in Winter Haven and around that were certainly concerned for you and praying for you and glad that you've had a good outcome. But, I mean, do you ever contemplate, hey, if I wasn't playing baseball and gone in for a blood test, I mean, how many 27, 28, 29-year-olds just go in for a routine blood test to find something like that? That could have been – I mean, that's a blessing in disguise right now is that you had that type of – doctor care from the trainers to the docs and everyone that were able to discover that. Absolutely. Um, and it's something I'm thankful for every day because there were no other signs that I was sick. I was maybe feeling a little more fatigued than normal, but nothing alarming. So, um, it's something that I would not have found out about until it was too late. Um, and, and it's something that I'm just, I, I, you know, I'm indebted to the doctors, my trainers, um, everybody. And, and yeah, if I, if I wasn't playing baseball, um, it would have been too late. So I, I'm very lucky. Well, um, we're all happy. You know, to be we're all... Talking here now. Thank you. So you started a foundation. Is your foundation based on uh, the, the illness that you had, or is it something else? Um, so it has definitely developed into that we started it actually about six months before i was diagnosed we did it in 2019 um that year i was um you know kind of really had a breakout year in 19 and thought it was time um pretty entrenched in baltimore and thought it was time to start a foundation so at that point it was more we were doing uh we were partnered with blessings in a backpack in baltimore which sends kids home on Fridays with food for the weekend right. um, at the uh, underprivileged schools. And we still are associated with them. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we just had a golf tournament in Winter Haven this past weekend. And a, a big a big uh, portion of the proceeds went to the Baltimore chapter of Blessings in a Backpack. So we stuck with that. Um, we didn't want to neglect that at all. And then um, – Another big thing we're doing right now is paying for people's medical bills directly that don't really have insurance and are having a tough time getting by. So we're, um, you know, that's something that's important to me. Whenever you're diagnosed, I was lucky enough to have good insurance and um, great health care, but not everybody has insurance. Um, you know, it's easy to tell people you're going to get through it, you know, and, and um, listen to your doctors and everything like that. But if they don't have insurance, they don't really have the means to pay for it. Um, the words can kind of be hollow, I think. So I wanted to make it our mission to help people out directly. Uh, something that's definitely important to me. Um, and, and something else we supported was there's a homeless mission in Winter Haven um, that we gave some proceeds to. And then there's a school, uh, Four Corners, um, it's a charter school that just started a baseball program a couple years ago. Um, and they've been driving like an hour to play um, in Hillsborough County. So we, some of the proceeds went to them to try to help them um, build a field on campus so they can kind of build their program up and help keep the local kids at the school there. If someone wants to support your foundation, write you a check, uh, is there a website to go to or social media? How, how if someone says, hey, yes. I'd, like to, I'd like to support what Trey and his group are doing, how do I do that? Yeah, so it's just – it's called the Trey Mancini Foundation. So if you look it up, they'll have um, – we'll have the payment info there. I know we have PayPal, Venmo, um, or through the website directly. Um, and my sister, Katie, um, is the head. She, she runs the organization. Okay. And my wife, Sarah, and I – um, and my younger sister, Meredith, are also obviously very heavily involved, right. too. But um, Katie kind of runs the day-to-day. So, um, yeah, it's called the Trey Mancini Foundation. Um, so, yeah, that, I appreciate that. Good. So that's T-R-E-Y-M-A-N-C-I-N-I Foundation. 
So yeah. If you're trying to figure out how to spell these names, Eli, I'm looking at you. Um, so 2021 comes around. You are back in the big leagues. You're back playing. You win the American League Comeback Player of the Year. That's got to be probably one of the happiest moments for your parents more than when you signed and when you played the first time is because you came back from a very serious uh, health issue. Um, what was the first game like when you got back? Oh, my gosh. It was it – was, uh... It was a whirlwind of emotions. It was almost like making my debut all over again. Yeah. Um, you know, baseball was kind of the furthest thing from my mind when I got diagnosed and was going through all that. Uh, so to be able to be back and alive was incredible. And, yeah, I think especially now I have a good perspective on everything. Whenever you're going through it, it's a little tougher. You know, I was only six months out from finishing chemo whenever I played again. Um, that season, which was really quick, um, you know, and, and I think I was a little hard on myself that year. And I look back at my stats, I did pretty well, um, quite well, actually, especially considering what I went through. But I definitely regret not enjoying it quite as much as I should have at the time. Um, and I have that perspective now, but it was definitely a tough year, mostly because I was so it, it was so soon since my diagnosis and going through the treatment that I was still within that year time span that I was just really worried about um, my health and, and the possibility of it coming back and things like that. So, um, you know, it was definitely a very whirlwind and emotional year. Um, but now that it's in the rear view from a few years, it's something that I'm proud of and, and um, really means a lot. I mean, sometimes it's hard to appreciate what you're going through while you're going through it. But like you say, a couple of years, exactly. a couple of years out, it's like, you know what, that was really a pretty special year. I might not have, you know, had the year I wanted to have, but I had the year that I might not have had. And, you know, I'm sure the fans in Baltimore probably were very appreciative of you being back there, not just for being in the lineup, for but for being healthy again. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was uh, the support from the Baltimore fans and, and the Orioles community was absolutely incredible. Hey, listeners. Hey, everyone. Hola. Hi, all. Hello, everybody. Hello. This is Rob Palumbo. This is Fred Hyde. This is Juliet Ashley Vai. Dr. Angela Garcia Falconetti. This is Congressman Scott Franklin. This is Margie Grant. This is Jake Palumbo. And I want to thank you for listening to Todd's podcast. Thank you for listening to Todd's podcast. Thank you for listening to Todd's podcast. Please make sure that you like and or subscribe. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget to subscribe to Todd's podcast on your favorite podcast app. Tune in and listen. Join in and listen to us. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, the, 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 we're kind of coming to a close because I know you're you're on your way, but I want to ask you about on July 28th in 2022, you hit an inside the park homer, and it was against the Devil Rays, I think, is the research I had. The guy lost it in the lights or the sun. It hit him in the head and bounced over. You were able to round the bases. When you were coming into third, did you know you were going home? Was the coach waving you in or were you, you said, coach, I don't care what you're doing. I'm running through your stop sign. Or was he waving you on in? No, no, he was waving me. And, and there's a little backstory. There's a little backstory to this one too. Um, it was, it ended up being my last at bat at Camden Yards as an Oriole. Oh, um, I didn't know that. It was my last year. It was my last year before I was a free agent. Our team was playing really well. We had had a huge turnaround that year, um, and like things were really going in the right direction. So I wasn't sure if I was going to get traded or not, and I ended up getting traded three days later. But um, it was Mo Gabba Day in Baltimore that day, and Mo Gabba, um, I recommend looking him up if you're listening. Um, just this absolutely incredible fan, this super fan we had in Baltimore, and he – he had a few different forms of cancer and, and um, he lost his sight as a baby and just um, he, he had the most incredible attitude and was such a special person. And he and I had struck up this friendship um, and, and hung out a lot. And he, he was just this absolutely incredible kid, especially with um, the cards he was dealt. So it was the second anniversary of him passing away and, uh, yeah, I hit that ball and it just went perfectly in line with the sun. 
um, and the right fielder on the Rays just didn't see it the entire time. And yeah, I had an inside the park home run, which I never thought was even possible. So all that like just lined up, and I, I thank Mo for that one um, on that day. But it was a pretty special moment. So I knew no matter what, I had to try for the inside park home run there. Uh, I, I mean, the fact that you had the presence of mind to think of Mo to reference Mo in your comments, and even today, I think it goes to your upbringing, your humbleness. Uh, I mean, I think that's a tribute to your family and your friends and, you know, just how you were raised and, and, and your personality in general, and I, I congratulate you on that. Um, no, thank you. I'd like to go through the lightning round because we only got a few minutes left, and these are just kind of quick questions, quick answers. So uh, what's your favorite food? Pizza. Love pizza. Best ballpark food. I got to go hot dog, like a fully loaded hot dog. Um, I think there's nothing better at a baseball game. Which ballpark has the best food? You know, as a, okay, as a player, let me think. Uh, Yankee Stadium, like hands down. If you're playing a doubleheader, do you get to get out and walk around more? Or are you pretty much just, hey, after the first game, you come in, you want to cool off, you shower, you stay in the clubhouse, you still stay in the moment of the game? Or do you have the ability to get out, decompress, and walk around and grab a hot dog or a chicken wing or whatever it may be? Um, yeah, there's not much time, especially with people in the stands. You can't yeah, really, sure. like, go around the park that much unless, yeah. you know, we're there early enough to, like, walk around the stadium. But we don't do it too much. But – um, yeah, between double headers, like mostly stay in the locker room and get locked in for the second game. So, what's your favorite movie? Shawshank Redemption. Who was your hero growing up? Uh, I'd say my dad. Um, you know, he um, he went to medical school in Grenada and um, just worked really hard to become a doctor and and he taught me such good work ethic so so i'll say my dad you know teaching your children work ethic is i think one of the most important jobs of being a a dad or a mom is you teach kids how to get up go to work work hard give an honest day's work i I think that's so important and it sounds like your dad and and your mom too have passed that along to you so i congratulate you on that yeah they absolutely absolutely what's the what's the best what's the best advice you've ever been given I would say just like having confidence in yourself no matter what. Um, you know, especially in baseball, there's so many highs and lows and it's easy to get down on yourself and doubt your ability. And I've gone through that even the last couple of years. But, um, you know, trusting the work that you put in and, and believing in yourself, there's nothing more important than that. Can you cook? <laughs> no. Not very good. Not very good. Um, I need my wife. Sarah is, is incredible. So I need her to teach me a little bit, especially whenever I'm going to be done playing baseball. Um, I'm going to need to, uh, yeah, learn how to cook and, and, uh, you know, start returning the favor and making her some meals. Um, what's your nickname, your baseball nickname? Uh, Boom Boom uh, has always been my nickname since I was a kid. Uh, it's because Boom Boom Mancini, Ray Mancini is a boxer. Um, so it always like has stuck with every team I've been on. Who's your favorite baseball player of all time? My, uh, so my favorite player growing up, uh, another like, I know it's kind of lightning round, but quick story, Ben Bruce Starr, he played for the in- for Cleveland, uh, now the Guardians, Indians at the time. But my dad, uh my dad saw a few of the Indian players' wives. Um, he was like the, one of the team doctors. And Ben Broussard came into his office one day, and, and my dad brought me in to meet him, and he was, like, so nice. Just an incredible guy. Um, and, um, you know, it, it made a lasting impression with me. So he was my favorite baseball player growing up. How about your favorite athlete? I mean, you've been around world-class athletes uh who are you most impressed with that doesn't have to be baseball yeah i think of all time i gotta go with michael jordan especially after the documentary that came out a few years ago just his tenacity um you know he's got an attitude and just championship mentality you can't teach there's so very few like him i think it's jordan brady um and 
Tiger Woods off the top top of my head are just three guys who are completely built differently. Um, and and that's more, I guess, the modern examples. But I know throughout the history of sports, there's a lot more. But um, but yeah, I, I would say Jordan just because of that. If you could have dinner with any three athlete legends would those be the three if you could say hey i want to have all three of them i would today. say so i'd love to pick their brains just um how they stay so focused and so um resolute throughout their whole careers um i, I would say those three it would be really interesting to, to pick their brains so who would pay for dinner of those of you four I not hope me. You say, I hope you say Michael Jordan or yeah or, not or me. I, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, hopefully uh, one of them will. Uh, what is that one. what is the best mascot name in the minor leagues for a team? Oh, there's some good ones. Um, there's a team called the Trash Pandas now. I think that's probably like the most outlandish one that I've that I've heard. Um, and and, and, I, and we only got a minute or two left. Uh, if you weren't in professional baseball, or as you uh, as your career transitions to, uh, over the next few years out of baseball, what is life going to be like for you? You said you want to start learning how to cook so you can cook for your wife. What do you want to do uh, for a living? Yeah, I'd like to maybe do a little speaking um, here or there just with everything I've gone through. Um, and, and public speaking has always kind of been a fear of mine, so it's something I'd like to conquer. Um, so that's one. And then – I wouldn't mind doing broadcasting on a part-time basis too. Okay. Um, I told you we'd get out by eight forty-five, and we're right at. I just gotta say one story that about tennis oh, yeah. with LB, and yeah. this, and for those that do or do not know LB again, he's my nephew. Uh, this was before you had a driver's license. Y'all went out to play tennis, and he said that you were up five zero, and he came back and made it 6-5, then you end up beating him in the tiebreaker. And yeah. he said, and LB, when he was younger, he used to throw these fits. We would call them Razzies. And um, he said he got so mad, he left you at the tennis courts because he drove, and he just said, I'm not taking him home. But he said he did calm down and come back and get you. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh so yeah, I like I said earlier, I played tennis my whole life, and LB was more self-taught. Um, right. He hadn't been playing very long at all, and he was really good. Um, so we played tennis all the time, and I I won just because I had played tennis my whole life. Right. Um, if he had been playing tennis his whole life, he would have crushed me though. Um, well, let's he, not tell him that. Yeah, I, I mean I'm okay to admit LB is an incredible <laughs> athlete, um, one of the best athletes you know, I've ever, um, you know, played baseball with. And so we played tennis all the time. So he finally, you know, he had this massive comeback. He had never taken a set from me. Um, I think he had set point. Yeah. Like you said, he was up six, five. Um, I had this huge collapse. So he was so pumped, finally maybe beat me. And then I dug deep and out of nowhere, just came storming back and, and ended up winning the set. And he, um, yeah, went ballistic just you know you know disappeared for 20 minutes um <laughs> into the forest and then i just i don't even see him come back i just see his truck leave um and uh you know i don't think i rubbed it in too much maybe a little bit but i don't know if it was enough to warrant being left at the court and this is before uber or anything like right. that so i think i'm just stranded at oh, that he, oh he said he stranded you that, yeah, it was at the um, the country club of Winter Haven, yeah. and and uh, yeah, he left me, and I kind of hung out there for a few. I was about to call my parents to see if they were around to maybe pick me up, but then right as I was about to do that, he came back and got me. Um, I don't think we he even said any words. He just dropped me off at my house, but he at least had the wherewithal to come get me. Well, now that we've illuminated this story and for 378 million listeners, LB, that one was for you. Um, is there anything yep. that I haven't asked you about that you would hope that I had, or did we touch on everything that you're happy with? Yeah, we touched on absolutely everything. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I really, yeah, appreciate you having me on. So Trey, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're driving and, and, and heading somewhere, but you did squeeze us in. You were very kind and generous with your time. 
Um, everyone is excited that you're healthy again and you're still playing and you're doing well in life. And we look forward to uh, continuing following you. So thank you very much, Trey and Cena. Appreciate it. Thank you, Todd. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. I want to thank you for listening to Todd's podcast. This has been your host, Todd Damsley. As always, don't forget to rate, review, follow, and subscribe to Todd's podcast on your favorite podcast app. If you have any questions for me or any suggestions for future guests, please call or text our number at 863-288-0944 or visit toddansler.com. Again, that's 863-288-0944 or visit my website, T-O-D-D. D-A-N-T-Z-L-E-R dot com. I look forward to hearing your questions and feedback and please take care.